All right. Well, we can see you. We can hear you. We're all set to go. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everyone for showing up. Today. Um, as I was explaining earlier, I, 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 a couple of hours ago, I was helping to coordinate the International Dark Sky Association's um, annual meeting. And there were 450 people in attendance out of 2,300 that had registered in 90 different countries. So that was a, that was a hoot. Uh, so we're gonna we're we're gonna focus in on uh, Pluto and its amazing story. So um, this is you're gonna walk away from this talk knowing so much about Pluto. Um, I guarantee it. All right. So um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that's truly remarkable uh, about our solar system, uh, and here are all the the major bodies shown to scale. Here's the sun over on the left hand edge shown to scale its limb is that we get such a variety of planets out of you know, the condensation of one interstellar cloud. Still, still amazes me. And, and you know the differences of the, of the major planets and the gas giants and the terrestrials, but even on the smaller scale, there's a, a huge variety of different kinds of objects. <clears throat> These are some of the major uh, moons, if you will. Pluto is shown there in the bottom row near the end. And, um, uh, just to give you a sort of comparison here, and uh, and you know Titan is big. Titan and Ganymede are both bigger than Mercury. If they were circling the sun, we might be calling them planets. So, in the um, uh, in the long ago, let's see. I think it was in the early eighteen hundreds. Um, uh, Johann Bode and Johann Titius uh, collaborated on what became known as the Titius Bode, Bode Law, Bode, because he was German. <clears throat> and uh, it's a simple numerical expression that you can see up there at the upper right uh, that, that does a remarkably good job of predicting the locations of the planets in astronomical units, an astronomical unit being the average distance of Earth from the sun. So <clears throat> for example, you add four to zero, Divide by 10, that's four tenths of an AU. That is almost exactly the, the distance from Mercury to the sun on average anyway. Four plus three is seven divided by 10, seven tenths of an AU, one AU and so forth. And this progression uh, did a remarkable job, except that it predicted that there was something missing between Mars and Jupiter. The, the progression should have predicted at 1.6 AU uh, I'm sorry, at, uh, let me do this again, at 2.8 AU, uh, a planet that, that apparently wasn't there. And so about the, uh, about the, the, the beginning of the 1800s, a bunch of European astronomers, and that was the nexus of, of astronomy at that point in time, the US hadn't really emerged yet, got together and decided they were going to find this planet that was between Mars and Jupiter. And literally, I am not making this up. They call themselves the Celestial Police. Uh, and these are the two guys. Uh, well, uh, Baron von Zach was the leader. And um, uh, Giuseppe Piazzi on New Year's Day in 1801 discovered an object that turned out to be between Jupiter and Saturn, the one we now know as Ceres. And uh, so the problem was solved. We had found the planet between, between Mars and Jupiter. And um, in very short order, within the next two or three years, three more objects between Mars and Jupiter were discovered. And they turn out to be the four largest asteroids, Vesta, Juno, Ceres, and Pallas. <clears throat> and if you look at tables of old uh, astronomy books of that era, you see, you see them listed as planets. Uh, in, in the listing of, of, uh, of the sun's planets. And there's a cautionary tale here for what eventually happens to Pluto. So uh, we have now seen a couple of those asteroids at close range. Uh, this is Ceres as seen by the Dawn spacecraft. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, and uh, here is Vesta. And along with Vesta, I, I include, this is a, a neat graphic by uh, Emily Lakdawalla, uh, of other asteroids that we have visited at close range uh, in their size re relative to Vesta. So we have, we have a pretty good idea, beginning to have a good idea of what asteroids are like. 
And so that sets the stage for Pluto, the, the little planet with a big moon. Um, this, uh, this, this is actually one of a series of postcards by an artist named Paul McGehee, or McGehee, who I spent a lot of time trying to track down and never did. Anyway, this Pluto's story actually begins long before Pluto itself was discovered. Uh, it was no less than uh, John Herschel who, who imagined that uh, beyond Neptune, there was a planet. And that got a little more well-formed as a thought in, 19, in the early 1900s when both Percival Lowell and William Pickering predicted the existence of a planet X out beyond, uh, beyond Neptune. Uh, and, and their reasoning was that, you know, uh, Neptune was predicted to exist because of its perturbations on the orbit of Uranus. And after Neptune's discovery uh, in 1846, it, there was still some thought that Uranus had a residual in its motion that wasn't explained by Neptune. And that's where this notion of a planet X, yet another planet out beyond Neptune came, came to pass. Well, <clears throat> Pluto was discovered. Uh, Lowell, you know, had, had by 1909, Lowell had built his Lowell Observatory out in uh, Flagstaff for observing Mars. He, he died uh, in, I think it was 1915 uh, or in the teens uh, and was never able to really see the fruit of his, his prediction come true uh, by Clyde Tombaugh. Now Clyde was a, was a remarkable young man who was uh, uh, born and raised in the Midwest and um, uh, was a keen observer with his home-built telescope made in part from tractor parts uh, on the farm that he and his family occupied. And he did careful sketches of the planets, which he sent to Lowell Observatory and it impressed them of, of how meticulous he was. And they hired him. They hired him to run uh, this telescope, which was a new astrograph uh, designed for finding Pluto. And uh, it's, it was a remarkable for its day, but way back here at the left-hand end, that is where the photographic plates were held. Uh, they were these huge glass plates. And so Tombaugh's job was literally to spend all night in this uh, often unheated dome. It was unheated, but in, in, in a Flagstaff winter, it got pretty cold. And then during the day, he would expose the plates, I mean, uh, uh, develop the plates and, and check them to see if, if Pluto was on it. And uh, the, the technique was that he would take two images of the same area of sky about three days apart, two to three days apart, and then set them up side by side in this gizmo, which is called a blink comparator, where by looking at the eyepiece right here, he could quickly flip back and forth between the two and look for things that moved. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the discovery image for Pluto one of the two discovery images. And I'm, I'm challenging you all to figure out which one is Pluto. It is not this. This is Delta Geminorum. Time's up. All right, Pluto is right here. Um, and, and remarkably, this was a very close to the predict to the area that uh, Clyde, uh, that uh, uh, Lowell had predicted that Pluto would be found. But as it turns out, as, and as we now know, um, first of all, there were no residuals in the orbit of Uranus. It was just uh, uh, you know, uncertainty in the data. And the second thing is that Pluto in no way could have influenced the orbital motion of, of uh, Uranus. And so it was therefore just darn fool luck that Tombaugh discovered Pluto close to where Lowell had predicted it to, to exist. Now, this is Clyde in his later years. He uh, uh, was a longtime uh, professor at the University of New Mexico in Las Cruces, which is where he and his Patsy, uh, wife Patsy lived. Uh, this is that same telescope that you saw uh, when he was a, a youth. Uh, photo I took of him. I got to know Clyde decently well. He was a really great guy. And he had more puns than Fritz does. Um, and so um, he, he uh, uh, at one point, he came back to the East Coast on a tour with David Levy and his wife, Patsy, 
uh, giving lectures and raising money for a, a fellowship, a graduate student fellowship in his honor. And he showed up in the Boston area and he and uh, the, the Tombaugh's and Levy, and they didn't really have a place to stay. So we put them up at our house in Chelmsford and uh, we sold that house uh, some time ago. But the last thing, but the last thing I did before leaving the house was put up this plaque in the guest bedroom. You notice it doesn't uh, say whether Pluto is a planet or not, simply that Clyde had discovered it and that he'd slept there. So, um, so we, we really didn't know a lot about Pluto. We, we knew its orbit. Uh, and eventually, fast forward a quarter of a century after its discovery, uh, photometry, careful measurement of the light reflected off of Pluto, showed that it had a rotation period of about six days. This is, this is a, a couple of different periods. And, and uh, you can see the scale down there at the bottom. I'm having trouble juggling all of this. Your, your, your lovely faces. Maybe I can do that. Oh, maybe I can. Can you still see my face? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. Um, yes, we can, Kelly. Okay, good. I've, I've actually eliminated all the rest of you. So all I'm seeing now is my screen. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see that, oh, interestingly, over time, although the period of Pluto's orbit, 6.4 days uh, it's, of its rotation, uh, didn't change the 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 character of its of its uh, bright and dark markings definitely changed over that period of time. We'll come back to that in a second. But we didn't know really anything about its surface, uh, about what was giving rise to that rotational um, uh, variation. And all we knew was that Pluto at best was a fourteenth magnitude dot. And there's a couple of ways you can get a fourteenth magnitude dot reflecting sunlight. Uh, it could be very small, but very reflective, or it can be much larger and having a dark surface. And both of these, all, all three of these cases here, reflect the same amount of sunlight in aggregate back to the sun. We couldn't resolve Pluto's surface, so we didn't know which of these was true. Remember, we were still looking for something, at least initially, uh, that could have been enough to, uh, you know, to, to alter the orbit of Uranus. Well, in 1965, we discovered that Pluto had a, an orbital resonance with Neptune. That is, its orbit was quite elongated, quite elliptical, uh, such that when Pluto is closest to the sun, it's actually closer than Neptune is. And in fact, that period was from 1979 to 1999. Pluto was its closest to the sun in 89, and uh, it won't be that close to the sun again for another 250 years, give or take. And so the question was, why don't Pluto and Neptune collide? And the answer is that they are in a resonance, an orbital resonance. So technically, it's called a mean motion resonance. Pluto goes around the sun twice in the time it takes Neptune to go around three times. And so this, uh, inter this close relationship prevents Pluto and Neptune from ever being in the same point in space at the same time, so they'll never collide. But we still didn't know anything about Pluto's size uh, to speak of. And then something really important happened in 1976, and that was uh, Dale Cruikshank and others discovered the presence of methane ice. Well, actually, it was methane in the atmosphere of Pluto, or what turned out to be the atmosphere. But methane, when it freezes, uh, and it should be frozen at that distance from the sun, creates a white ice. So that meant that Pluto was really more like the, this than this. And it meant that Pluto couldn't be very large and it couldn't be very massive either. And so here is, uh, this is, this is uh, a, a typical spectrum. You know, methane is a very uh, spectroscopically easy to detect gas. And so um, those broad bands that you see there, this is in the near infrared part of the spectrum, just out of uh, the visual spectrum, uh, were, were telling us that Pluto had an icy surface. And then something, so we knew, we knew that it had an icy surface, but maybe it's an ice covered, you know, giant hunk of iron, a, a, a cannonball with a frosty coating. But then something happened in 1978, just two years later, it was discovered that Pluto had a satellite. And uh, this is the actual discovery photograph over here, uh, taken by James Christie. 
and this is the, the corresponding orbit of what came to be called Charon uh, around Pluto. Now, Pluto is the god of the underworld, and Charon is the, uh, the captain of the, the, the uh, uh, boat driver that carries people down the river Styx uh, into the underworld. And so uh, there's James Christie and his wife, Charlene, just gotten married when, uh, when, when uh, this satellite was discovered. It says my internet connection is unstable. If it, if it gets bad, somebody let me know, please. Uh, but in any case, uh, trying to impress his new wife, I guess, uh, Christie said that he was going to name the new moon of Pluto after his wife, Charlene. But then he realized that it had to satisfy uh, mythology. And he went running to his mythology book and he, he discovered that there was this god, Charon, uh, who was uh, one of the gods of the underworld. And I uh, was the boat captain, the boat driver. And so he named the moon uh, Charon, but he really named it Charon after Charlene, his wife. And so if you hear somebody describing the moon as Charon, they don't know this story. And if you hear them call it Charon, as you now do, uh, you, you know the story behind it. So it turns out that, that Charon is a fairly sizable satellite, as, as, uh, at least compared to Pluto. And they orbit in a way such that their, their center of gravity, what's called the Berry Center, is outside of Pluto itself. Our Earth-Moon system is a similar mismatch uh, like that, but the bare center of the Earth-Moon system is actually still inside the Earth, but not so with Pluto and Charon. And so this is what happens as they, as they dance around each other, and they're both locked in synchronous rotation. So it takes uh, Charon 6.4 days to go around Pluto, and Pluto is locked facing Charon and vice versa, and that explains Pluto's uh, apparent uh, orbital uh, revolutionary I'm sorry, rotation period of 6.4 days. Well, that was great, but we still didn't know anything about the surface or really the diameter of Pluto. And in 1985, a fortuitous uh, situation happened where, whereby the um, uh, Charon was passing in front of and behind Pluto for a couple of years. And this, this, by carefully monitoring the combined light of the two objects, we got a little bit of a handle of, the, uh, of their relative diameters. The upshot of all of this that I'm, I'm showing you here is that over time, when, when Pluto was first hypothesized, you know, back first by Herschel and then by uh, Lowell and Pickering, it was thought to be much more massive than the Earth, maybe 10 times more massive. And then it got discovered, it wasn't very bright, and then methane was detected. And so we got to the point by the 1980s down here at the, over here, where it was realized that Pluto was um, just you know, less than, uh, was really only a, a couple thousandth of the mass of the Earth. It could not possibly be uh, affecting anything, uh, and its, its stature began to be called into question. Now, that changed a little bit when, when in 1988, uh, James Elliott from MIT and a team from MIT took the Kuiper Airborne Observatory out over the Pacific and uh, recorded the occultation of a star by Pluto. Pluto passed directly in front of a star, and this was the path, this was the combined light of the two objects together. So uh, here we are, uh, the, we're basically measuring the brightness of the star, which is much brighter than, than Pluto itself. And then suddenly the star takes a dip because it went behind Pluto and now it's out again. And if Pluto had no atmosphere, this dip would have very straight vertical lines, but you can see they're somewhat sloped. And it proved the fact that Pluto had a, at least a tenuous atmosphere. And uh, this was a big, exciting discovery. I have the, the, the privilege and the honor of being on that flight. I was on the flight when Pluto's atmosphere was discovered. Uh, and it was, it was really very, very exciting. So, Fast forward to the Hubble Space Telescope days, and we began to eke out little bits of detail on the surface of Pluto. The color here is relatively correct. It did have this kind of orange cast to it. And we were able to determine that there were bright and dark markings all over it. Now, the interesting thing is that this is a, a flip comparison of two Hubble images. 
taken about nine years apart. And they're projected to be the same. And I want you to notice how much the character of the bright and dark markings changes. But I want you to notice this one right here, this bright spot kind of stays the same in both. That will come into play a little bit later on. But clearly something was happening on the surface of Pluto. Ices were moving around or something, who knows what. And so <clears throat> Pluto maintained its, you know, Pluto had been predicted to be discovered as the ninth planet. It was discovered at Lowell Observatory where Lowell had made the prediction. Uh, the observatories at the time, uh, Clyde Tombaugh's bosses made a big sort of PR deal about it. And it was, a, you know, we, we, we named the planet, Pluto, well, we didn't, but uh, the planet became, this object became called Pluto as the ninth planet of the solar system, even though it was kind of small and, you know, not very consequential. But that all changed in 92 when Dave Jewett and uh, Jane Liu discovered an object uh, temporarily designated in 1992 QB1, now known as Albion, uh, out in the general vicinity of Pluto. And it turns out that that object is one of a great many objects in what is now known and recognized as the Kuiper Belt. And you can see up there at the top, Pluto's orbit uh, for comparison which in turn is embedded in an even larger cloud known as the Oort cloud. Uh, and both of these are, are sort of primordial from the birth of our solar system. And in, in fact, the Kuiper belt uh, is, is essentially uh, bits of, of matter that condense into icy bodies. Uh, after the formation of the planets, they are, they are leftovers from planetary formation. This is a top-down view of the outer solar system. Uh, Pluto's here, this is the orbit of Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, and all the rest of us are close here to the sun. And all the red and white dots are, are objects in the Kuiper belt. This, this image is more than two years old, and it turns out that the Minor Planet Center has not updated this graphic. Uh, they must have a manpower shortage or something there. But in any case, the, the red objects are what are considered the classical Kuiper belt. These are essentially in the plane of the planetary system. And all the little white dots I wanna call your attention to, these are all objects which like Pluto have a three to two orbital resonance with Neptune. All this by way of saying Pluto is, is dynamically at least not special, nor is it physically very special. It's a very small body. It's one of the largest objects, if not the largest object in the Kuiper belt as far as we know, uh, but it certainly was a lot smaller than all the rest of the planets. And here's a comparison. Here's the Earth and Moon compared to Pluto and Charon. Pluto's actually quite a bit smaller than our own Moon. So in, by the late 80s, you know, astronomers were starting to wonder aloud whether in fact <clears throat> Pluto deserved to have planetary status. And by the 1990s, this had really kind of reached a fever pitch. And um, it got to the point where the International Astronomical Union had to, or uh, they, they issued an edict uh, saying, look, Pluto is a planet, period. Pluto is a planet, end of discussion, which made a lot of people happy. Uh, this is actually a, a comic by a, a, an artist named Dave Grandlin, uh, who's out here in the Metro West. Uh, interestingly, he didn't actually draw Pluto, he drew Goofy, but all right, never mind. Um, so, that seemed to settle it for a while. And I mentioned that Clyde had made a tour of uh, the Boston area. He gave a, a presentation at Harvard where he actually met uh, this guy on the right, who um, uh, Brian Marsden, who was sort of the gatekeeper for all discoveries in the solar system at the time. And Brian was one of the principal uh, outspoken critics of Pluto being called a planet. He wanted it to be a minor planet, just like a, an oversized asteroid. And so they, they met and they were cordial and they were pretty friendly, but I want you to notice the death grip that Clyde has here on Brian's hand. Uh, that it was, it was a, a, a definitely a photo op. Okay, so the IAU had put its mark on, on, uh, on things and said, Pluto is a planet. And then in 2005, 
uh, Mike Brown and his team discovered an object out in the Kuiper Belt, uh, which came to be called Eris, which appeared to be larger than Pluto. Now we have a problem. Because if Pluto is a planet, then Eris, if it's really larger than Pluto, must be a planet. Or imagine that Pluto had never been discovered. Discovering Eris in 2005, we'd call it a Kuiper Belt object and, and, and not call it a planet. And, and so therefore, is Pluto a planet? This argument raged for a year and a half. Um, this is a, a sort of uh, artist concept showing the variety of the very largest objects out of the Kuiper Belt. Here's the moon down here in the corner for scale, Pluto and, and Charon, uh, along with other moons that we'll mention in a minute, uh, and other objects. Eris, it turns out to be almost exactly the same size as Pluto. It's just a tiny bit smaller as best we know. But it still brought the whole discussion to a head. And uh, 15 years ago now, the International Astronomical Union, which meets every uh, three years, uh, met in Prague. And uh, they decided to, to decide what constituted the planet. They had a committee that, that uh, uh, tried to come up with a definition for a planet. And there was a lot of back and forth. The Europeans, the European planetary community has had a lot of dynamicists who, who wanted Pluto to just be a Kuiper Belt object because dynamically that's what it is. Uh, a lot of the American astronomers still felt that, you know, deserve planethood and they went back and forth and they debated, you know, is it, is it, it what's a planet? Is it a, um, um, and so forth. And, and so the recommendation came down and was, is actually from this uh, task force and it was voted down. And what they did instead, and this was the actual vote, I guess you had to have a yellow card in order to vote. Um, they voted to approve this definition. This is the definition of a planet. It is a celestial body that is orbited around the sun. And so I guess that all the other objects that we find uh, orbiting other stars uh, don't count as planets. It is, it has enough mass to be round, which is okay, that's kind of reasonable and sensical. Except that when you discover a distant object, think of Pluto, for example, you have no idea what its mass is. It wasn't until we had discovered a, a, a satellite around Pluto that we could determine its mass. And then here's the, the catch. It's cleared its neighborhood uh, around its orbit. And I, over the years, I've tried to come up with a decent analogy for this, what clearing the neighborhood means. It means there's no, it's massive enough that there's nothing else around it. It's been scattered out. Um, uh, you think back to your school days, grammar school days, and um, you're out on the playground at recess and the, the school bully uh, starts walking through the, the playground and he, he's, he, it's a he, right? And uh, he, he's, uh, he's looking to pick a fight. Well, you get out of the way of this bully and that's what clearing the neighborhood is all about. So, so it, it, the problem is that clearing the neighborhood only works when you have dense packing of, of, uh, of bodies. Uh, and so by this definition, Oh, oh, by the way, so this, this is what was going to be called a planet and objects that weren't massive enough to meet this definition were going to be called dwarf planets. And so uh, one of these is a dwarf planet, that's Ceres, uh, but Vesta does not count as a dwarf planet because it doesn't have enough mass to have made itself round. Ser uh, Vesta is a little bit oblong. And then the question became, well, uh, is Earth a dwarf planet? Well, no, of course Earth is in dwarf planet because it's near the sun and it's cleared out its orbit. But if you took the Earth, imagine taking the Earth and taking it out to the distance of Pluto, uh, although Earth is pretty massive, it would not be massive enough to completely clear its neighborhood. So it wouldn't classify, uh, satisfy the, the criterion of being a planet. Okay, so all that is preamble. Uh, uh, in, 15 years ago and change, we launched the New Horizons spacecraft to visit Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. Um, I'm sorry, that's right. So it was launched in 2006. It arrived there in 2015, which is like six, more than six years ago at this point. Here's its trajectory. It passed by Jupiter at close range uh, to pick up some uh, speed. And uh, here was its launch. Um, uh, and it left the Earth at the fastest velocity of any interplanetary probe, something like 50,000 miles an hour. 
It did a it did some imaging of Jupiter during the fly during its flyby of Jupiter, sort of a test of its instruments. This is not the Great Red Spot. It's one of the other big ovals that uh, orbit in Jupiter. It did some imaging of uh, Io. You can see this is a little GIF animation showing an erupting volcano at the near the pole of Io. And so we had headed out uh, to to uh, to Pluto. And by the time of the launch. We realized that Pluto had another couple of small satellites, Nix and Hydra, um, also taken from uh, mythology of, uh, of the underworld. And, uh, and so, it, but by the time after New Horizons was launched, we, we realized that there were two more small satellites uh, called Kerberos and, um, uh, and Nix. Um, and sticks, I'm sorry, Kerberos and sticks. And so now we have a problem because, because these new satellites are so small that if something were to hit them, they would uh, kick, uh, debris would be kicked off that would not readily uh, get swept back up. And so there was some concern by the project, by the New Horizons project, that there would actually be a ring around Pluto that would uh, create a, 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 an impact hazard. Well, that turned out not to be the case. And so Pluto uh, uh, was visited by New Horizons in July of 2015. And Pluto's tipped over on its side as it orbits and, and its moon system is likewise tipped. So it kind of a, presents a bullseye pattern in space. And so New Horizons was going through there pretty fast. And uh, because of Pluto's very slow rotation rate, uh, we really only got a good look at half of Pluto um, during the flyby. These are the experiments. Uh, for those who are all of a certain age, you will identify with Ralph and Alice. And yes, they are named after the two characters in the Honeymooners. Power is supplied by uh, uh, an RTG radio isotope thermoelectric generator, which is a fancy way of saying that there was encapsulated plutonium. And the heat from that was uh, from the decay of the plutonium was converted into electricity. And this is not an experiment, but uh, on the underside of, of the spacecraft is a small canister that in, includes some of the uh, uh, remains of Clyde Tombaugh. And so he did get to see, um, he did get to visit his, his uh, namesake, uh, Pluto. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a zoom in with, right along with New Horizons just for comparison. This is the very best Hubble Space Telescope image of Pluto. And uh, I, with a year to go, this is now all New Horizons stuff. Uh, the spacecraft was already resolving uh, Pluto and Charon. And then by, with six months to go, the detail got a little bit better. Notice that Charon is darker than Pluto. It's not as reflective. And now, with only three months to go, we're starting to see starting to see some surface detail, and you can see that barycentric motion. You can see Pluto wobbling here in a way around the center of mass. And now, just three weeks ago, we're really starting to see a lot of a lot of detail on Pluto. And uh, and this is this is the uh, the the pair uh, Pluto and Charon, and. You know, even from afar, there were a lot of tantalizing details, like this bright white spot, uh, which came to be called Tombaugh Regio. This was the heart of Pluto that some of you might remember seeing. Uh, uh, whereas um, Pluto is covered with methane ice, Charon is covered with water ice. Now, because of the flyby geometry, there was an entire side of Pluto that we didn't get to see very well, and this is the that poorly seen side. This is for the rest of our lives, this is the best that we're going to see of this particular hemisphere of Pluto. There's some tantalizing details there, but not a lot we can really um, talk about. Really, it was the other side of Pluto that was seen well. And um, this is a sequence showing it going around in its rotation. And so here we are. This is on encounter day. Now, Pluto is so far away that the light travel time is something like four hours. And so we didn't actually have a record of Pluto being visited during its close, the, the close flyby New Horizons. It was all recorded to tape. There was no live stream or anything like that. This was down at the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins in Maryland. 
which was the control center. It was not NASA, not JPL. It was uh, at APL. And this is the, the, the formal countdown to the flyby of Pluto. And I want you to notice that the countdown begins at 9, not at 10, because Pluto is the ninth planet. People got very excited about something they could not possibly see. Well, New Horizons was fantastically successful. And um, this is a natural color image of Pluto. And there is that big heart, uh, Tombaugh Reggio. Uh, and it, it now turns out to have two kind of distinct halves. So the whole thing is Tombaugh Reggio. And this half is called Sputnik Planitia, this sort of extremely white part here. And this was the part that in the Hubble telescope images uh, stayed bright all the time. This is a natural color view. Notice that there are bright and dark markings. And then this is a false color view, which brings in some of the near infrared imaging. And uh, this is how we're able to start telling some of the, the surface uh, materials that are on, on the surface of Pluto. This is, is uh, definitely uh, nitrogen ice here uh, with a skim coat of methane ice. Pluto does have this thin atmosphere. This dark reddish stuff over here uh, might be rich in, you know, gooey organic compounds called tholins. Uh, and we now realize that Pluto is not a, a uh, uh, just an ice ball, a giant ice cube. It does have about half of its diameter is rock. And uh, the outer uh, half is mostly frozen water ice. And it's thought that at the base of that ice layer between the ice and the rock is perhaps a, a liquid water layer that, uh, that is still liquid, which is remarkable if you think about it because Pluto doesn't have much mass or surface area. And you would think that it would have cold, uh, chilled just completely frigid all the way through over four and a half billion years, but apparently not. One of the interesting things about Pluto's surface is that Many areas are, are heavily cratered, which suggests to geologists that they have been exposed to space a long time. They're old surfaces. They've picked up a lot of craters. But Sputnik Planitia and uh, Tombaugh Reggio over here are almost crater-free, which, again, says that these must be very youthful surfaces. So we found all kinds of things going by uh, Pluto uh, with the cameras that there are sticking up uh, quite strong topography, which unlike uh, on the Earth, there is no rock in view that we, these are these these promontories, these mountains are uh, essentially exposures of, of rough water ice. And some of them have been named uh, for Hillary and Norgay. This is uh, uh, Edmund Hillary and uh, Norgay. I'm trying to think of his first name, who first. Hey, hey. Thank you. Uh, who first assault, uh, ascended uh, Mount Everest. Uh, this is a kind of funky area showing these mountain ranges. Now I want you to notice that the mountains are kind of brightish white on top, but there's like dark stuff in between. This is kind of a talus, uh, scientists think. And then over here, this is the, this is the edge of, of Sputnik Planitia, which itself is pretty weird. And turns out that Pluto, um, th this nitrogen sea, frozen nitrogen sea has been in motion. You can see here, there's, there's flow marks going through here. Here's some more. You can follow the flow marks right at the edge of Sputnik Planum. And, um, you know, this ice is flowing around. Something is energizing it, like a glacier flows on Earth. Uh, it, on Earth, it's because of gravity flowing downhill often. But in the case of Pluto, something must be you know, heating it and causing it to become mobile. Uh, and so these, these polygons in, in, in Sputnik Planum are, are churning around. There are all kinds of weird textures in the surface. Some of which are explain, can be explained. One, like these pits, not explained very well. Here's something called snakeskin terrain right near the day-night terminator. Just a weird formation. Very, very amazing stuff. It, to think about it, we've gone from not knowing what Pluto looked like at all uh, pre-Hubble 
to uh, you know having details that are just less than a kilometer on the side. It's just really remarkable. And uh, the the spacecraft saw a couple of things that looked like mounds with a caldera in the center and it was initially thought that these might be volcanoes ice volcanoes on on the surface but recent uh recent research suggests no they're, they're probably not ice volcanoes just a, a a weird landform but pluto does have that thin atmosphere that was discovered by uh, by mit back in 1988 by uh, james elliott and his team it is very thin but it is blue it has Rayleigh scattering in it just like earth's atmosphere uh, that's telling us a lot about the uh, the particles in the atmosphere. And it turns out that it's got a lot of haze in it and that there is a lot of uh, individual little layers within the haze. These are not really uh, layer like dust layers settling out. they're They're actual sort of gravitational waves that are that are propagating up through this um, atmosphere and causing condensations. Uh, um, uh, I'll think of them as ripples. Well, although Pluto's atmosphere is very thin now, there's evidence on the surface that at one point, it must have had a thick enough atmosphere to allow the surface uh, temperature to be above the melting point of this uh, uh, nitrogen that, that's frozen now. But we see things that like, there's little ponds on the surface and there's little tiny dendritic patterns of, as, as if liquid is flowing down hillside. <clears throat> and so the, the question becomes, uh, how, how is it that Pluto in the fairly recent past was warm enough to have a uh, thick atmosphere? And I, I can't go into it tonight, but it turns out that Pluto goes through orbital cycles. Remember, it's tipped over on its side, so its pole is pointing toward the sun. And it goes through orbital cycles that periodically cause these polar regions to become quite warm. And that causes a lot of the uh, the frozen material to to melt and mobile become mobile and shift around uh, and maybe even flow across the surface. Now Sharon is pretty weird too. I mentioned that its surface is covered with water ice. Uh, here's some of the the interesting features that that um, that were seen. Uh, there's a huge fracture uh, along its midsection, and what what is thought to have happened here is that imagine that you have a um, uh, water that you're freezing in your in your refrigerator freezer and uh, you know the outside freezes first right and the, in the inside of that ice cube is the last to freeze but frozen water has more volume um, than liquid water and so as the innermost bit of ice freezes it can crack the exterior and cause it to expand and that's what we think is happening here as 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 uh, Sharon uh, froze throughout it eventually uh, sort of burst at the seams and, and caused these uh, long fractures and then there's this sort of reddish polar cap which at first was thought to be material that maybe was imported from pluto as a kind of deposit but now we think probably not in any case it might well be related to some organic compounds these are um when you irradiate mixtures of methane, which is CH4 and nitrogen in a lab, uh, you get higher order hydrocarbons and, and they tend, out, tend often to be, have this sort of uh, brownish orange color. Uh, they're generically called folins. That's a term that Carl Sagan came up with. That big gash across the center of Sharon is called serendipity cosma. And I think I have a little fly over here so that you can watch. Uh, using the images that they have of Pluto and Charon from the New Horizons, you kind of this is going over Serendipity Cosma, that giant. It's a rift actually, kind of like the giant rift zone in Africa, uh, which is where two plates are are tearing apart. Now, the leader of the New Horizons team, uh, Alan Stern, had a kind of whimsical side, and so. You know, on Pluto, there were there were conventions, IAU conventions for naming things, but on on Charon, there weren't. And so they kind of came up with these great quirky uh, names like a Spock and Kirk, Sulu, uh, you know, and uh, 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 we're, we're, we're Nemo, Uhura, 
this is great. All, all characters from Star Trek. Well, they didn't actually get their way with that. One, what, what was retained was Kubrick for Stanley Kubrick and Clark for um, uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. And so, um, and so the New Horizons spacecraft also saw the, the, this four small satellites at, at some level of detail. This is the best we're going to see of them. And we also got to characterize their orbits. They have very interesting orbits. Some of them, here's Pluto and Charon here, and these have orbits that have, uh, uh, very, some are very short, some are very long. Here's a little animation showing what it would look like if you could follow them in time. And uh, some, some wild spinners there, and some are even spinning retrograde, retrograde, which is opposite the sense that, that you think they would be. Okay, so we went from 1990, where Pluto had not yet been explored. You might remember that the Postal Service created a whole series of nine stamps uh, after, the, um, after Voyager 2 went by Neptune. But Pluto hadn't yet been explored, so that was its stamp in that collection. And now it's an obsolete stamp. We now know that Pluto has been explored. And in fact, Pluto did get its own stamp uh, about five years ago, along with New Horizons. Um, and so I've, I've got some of those stashed away in the drawer somewhere. Here's uh, Alan Stern uh, with his famous bumper sticker, My Other Vehicle Explored Pluto. Um, he's, he's quite the character Alan is. Now, the interesting thing, I, I think, uh, I'm, I've been in this game a long time. Um, I remember, and some of you probably remember, the Mariner 4 flyby of Mars, which is July 14th, 1965. That was our first close-up look at another planet other than the moon. And exactly 50 years later, to the day, New Horizons flew by Pluto. I think that's a remarkable coincidence. Well, that was not the end of Pluto's uh, of New Horizons journey. It was billed as a as a um, as an exploration of the Kuiper Belt. And so, uh, after it left Pluto, the the goal was to try to find another Kuiper Belt object to visit, and they did identify one barely, just in time which got the nickname of Ultima Thule. Um, there's its, does it, here's its, uh, these are the discovery images. They had to use the Hubble Space Telescope to find something that New Horizons could fly by. And uh, the predicted flyby date was January 1st, 2019. So not quite three years ago. And uh, I'm gonna kind of skip by this. It turns out that amateur astronomers using uh, off the shelf, off the shelf uh, uh, Dobsonians recorded an occultation, actually a couple of them, by this object, MU69, uh, and were able to, the, 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 we needed to know exactly where it was in space so that New Horizons could be maneuvered to fly past it. There was a series of three occultations um, in, in a quick succession uh, during 2017 and 2018. One of them involved tracking with the uh, uh, SOFIA, the this is NASA's flying observatory. That big hole in the side of the 747 contains a very short focus, large uh, reflecting telescope that looks out the side. And it was this occultation here in July of 2017 that really nailed it. Um, and you can see, if you watch really carefully, that little blink there, that is MU69 passing in front of that star for just a fraction of a second. It was recorded by a couple of stations, and the upshot was that it wasn't round. It probably was shaped like a peanut based on, on this fit to the occultation tracks. So here we are two years uh, ahead of the flyby, imagining what this place is going to look like, thing is going to look like. And here is uh, January 1st, 2019. Uh, I was down there for this encounter. It was a great way to spend New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Uh, and so... Um, uh, a lot of kids. These were these were kids that I think um, they they were all born since New Horizons was launched, and I think they're members of the of the of the you know children of the team members. So this is what this object looks like. And MU sixty nine was its sort of temporary designation. It is what's called a um, a uh, contact binary. These are two objects that were at one point in orbit around one another, and they they, they sort of spiraled in on each other until they connected at this neck, which is bright. It's a, it's a period, uh, 
some interesting bright material. This is a little uh, series of images showing out in that portion of the Kuiper belt how we think these objects came together. Uh, they they formed as a sort of binary like this, and then they eventually uh, got stuck together um, and uh, became a single object. And that that uh, Acasa linea is the uh, is the join. And it turn, you wonder why it's bright. It's probably a localized concentration of ice. Uh, when we have, imagine this thing out in the Kuiper Belt and things are peppering its surface all the time, vaporizing little bits of, of ice as gas. The gas doesn't completely uh, uh, go away. It heads toward the center of gravity, which turns out to be right along here. And, uh, and it condenses and it forms a little ice ring. And so, uh, uh, that this this object um, really represents. It's now been formally named Arakoth, which is a word meaning sky from the Powhatan uh, Native American tribe, which is the tribe that inhabits the area of Maryland, uh, all the Mid Atlantic actually, but the area of Maryland in which the Applied Physics Laboratory uh, exists. So it's a it's a it's a um, an indigenous name, Arakoth. And so that, that's where we're at. Uh, New Horizons is on its way into the greater depths of uh, the solar system. It's now 50 astronomical units from the sun. And for those who were asleep for the first 58 minutes of this talk, I will tell you everything that you need to know about Pluto in 80 seconds. Pluto explored. How are Earth and Pluto alike and different? Pluto is very far from Earth, 3 billion miles, and very cold, minus 380 degrees. Earth is almost six times larger, but the two planets are alike in many other Oops, what did I do? Other ways. Both have glaciers made of ice. Here on Earth, that's water ice, H2O. On Pluto, it's frozen nitrogen gas, which still can blow, even at such low temperatures. On Earth, our mountains are made of rock. But Pluto's so cold that water is as hard as rock and holds up mountains as tall as the Rockies. We've got volcanoes here on Earth that erupt red hot lava. And it sure looks as if there are volcanoes on Pluto, but most likely oozing exotic ices such as carbon monoxide and methane. Both planets have blue skies and atmospheres containing nitrogen. And both have oceans, with Earth, of course, outside. But Pluto's likely deep down inside. Earth and Pluto, very much alike and totally different. That's Earth and Pluto Explored. Okay. So. Pluto. I think that's Pluto it. So I'll stop sharing. I think I'll stop sharing. <laughs> sharing has, oh, okay, all right. So thank you for your attention. And um, uh, I'd love to entertain some questions if you have them. Thank you. Uh, real quick, do we have any, uh, any questions from the people on Zoom? I'd like to know about X-rays that they have uh, detected coming from Pluto. Yeah, so um, I, I, well, first of all, Eleanor, I will say that I'm not familiar with that. I, I can imagine that X-rays can be coming from the interaction of X-rays with the gas in its atmosphere. We know that a lot of comets actually have uh, give off X-rays because cosmic ray particles and others, uh, very high energy particles, um, in, interact with the gases around the cometary nucleus. So uh, I will have to look that one up. I, I confess I do not know about that. Anybody else online with a question? Bill, nothing from you? Well, uh, the status of plutoids. Um, the IAU mentioned plutoids in their definitions, um, and I'm wondering whether that is now being an accepted verbiage. No, <laughs> no one, no one, no one uses that. Um, I think that that 
you know, there, there are, there was, um, there is a dynamical definition called Plutino. And uh, Plutino is one of those Kuiper belt objects in a two to three resonance with Neptune as Pluto is. But in terms of Plutoids, you know, things like Eris and uh, um, uh, Albion, objects that are close in size, you saw that no one is calling them that. There, there is this more broad characteristic of dwarf planethood. And so, <clears throat> uh, interestingly, the, the IAU group that's responsible for making that call, whether something is or isn't a dwarf planet, basically is, is, uh, has abrogated its responsibility and is not doing a good job of that. It's up to the rest of us to decide where, which are the dwarf planets and which are not. I would think a Plutino would be a, uh, a massless planet. <laughs> Very difficult to detect. Exactly, exactly. Um, coming from the other, coming from, instead of coming from the sun, it's coming from the outside in, right? Right. I'm um, looking online right now in the chat. Um, uh, it looks like your green screen. So, and we're not going to allow any more puns. Sorry, Fritz. Okay. Do we have any any questions from the room here? Just speak normally. The microphone's on the ceiling. And and Eleanor, while we're waiting for that, I quickly looked it up. It it is in fact that was a, a result announced in 2016. And they do believe it's the interaction of the solar wind or uh, high energy rays with the atmosphere of Pluto. Thank you, that's great. Well, I have a real quick one, uh, Kelly. Is, it, is Pluto still the largest Kuiper belt object we know of? Yes, barely. Uh, you know, the, the hunt is on for this mythical planet nine or planet X. Um, and that is because some of the largest, some of the Kuiper belt objects with the most distant orbits that go hundreds of astronomical units from the sun are highly elliptical and they appear to be aligned in a way that suggests some massive body has reoriented and organized their orbital uh, planes. We haven't found the object yet, but there, there have been uh, now going on 10 years has, has been the, the notion that there is this very massive object out there um, that has yet to be discovered. And the hunt goes on. The two big teams that are looking for it are um, Michael Brown at Caltech and Scott Shepard at Carnegie. And so, uh, you know, there may be objects in the Kuiper belt that are bigger than Pluto. But they have to be, and you know, a lot of people are looking for Kuiper belt objects now. Uh, and so it would have to be sufficiently far away that even though it's, it's large, it's, uh, it's too dim to have been picked up. Okay, thanks. Looks like uh, half of GAC is online. Uh, Jim, do you have a question or Phil? Anything before we move to the room? No? Anybody have any questions here? It's a quick one. Uh, what's the minimum size uh, of telescope do you need to see Pluto? Right. Um, so it, a really great question. Um, Pluto, as I mentioned, was closest to the sun in 1989. And it has a fairly eccentric orbit. So it is moving farther away from the sun progressively. Uh, even when it is closest to the sun, it's or when, when we're closest to Pluto at opposition, uh, it's getting dimmer and dimmer. Uh, there was a time when you could pick it up pretty well with an eight inch telescope. Uh, now I would think that 10 inches of aperture would be marginal, more if you've got it. Um, or, you know, Mario would probably pick it up and, and discard it because it, it was probably in the way of some nebula he was trying to. Um. <laughs> Tell him I said that. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, a 10 inch telescope, I think. Um, I, I have a, um, all the trees around my property. I, I live in Chelmsford, so it's pretty dark here. Uh, and so I have a nine and a quarter and I haven't actually tried, but I might, I might someday. 
By the way, and I have a question for you. Um, I know that there was a lot of mobilization of uh, dark sky advocacy around the Halibut Point uh, observing area. Can you give me an update on that? Problem solved. Good. We had to uh, get a special use permit from them. And to get the permit, we had to have a million dollar liability policy. But that's small change for GAC, you know, we're rolling in it here. <laughs> and, and the DCR put in, put in lights that are, uh, that are both reasonable and can be shut off, I think, right? They haven't done anything with the lights. We're deep inside the park now, up by the visitor center where it's very, very dark. Okay, great. There's, there's a rogue street light that was lighting up our whole observing field. So we weren't all that sorry to see it go. Yeah. And so uh, for Bill Waller, who put that link in the chat to Plutoids, I, you know, that, the, that's dated from 2008, right? Which was just shortly after the IAU vote. And, uh, I, you know, I keep pretty close tabs on the literature. No one is using that term. So where did the hydrocarbons on Pluto come from? Ah, great question. So you've got, um, uh, you've got, you know, you have methane, CH4, and you know, you have nitrogen, which is N2, uh, or, or that's molecular nitrogen. And you might remember the slide I showed with those little, those little vials right. of brown, brownish stuff. If you take methane, nitrogen mixtures and you irradiate them, uh, you get higher order forms of hydrocarbons like uh, formaldehyde, for example, is has the formula HCN. And so if you can imagine like really complex uh, hydrocarbon chains, tar like substances, uh, you don't need oxygen. Um, uh, uh, those three are, are sufficient to get you, uh, you know, fairly high mass organic m matter that uh, compounds that 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 tend to have that color. Just, just by taking the, the, the ices that are there, the nitrogen ice and the uh, methane ice and irradiating them with cosmic rays and you know ultraviolet and all that over a long enough time, uh, those reactions take place. Okay, thank you. Oh, somebody is pointing out that HCN is cyanide. Yes, thank you very much. I think it's uh, H, H, well, anyway, I'll take the sign. I thank you, Tom. You've been very careful with me, uh, I, but I, I know that formaldehyde is, is it C2? C-H2O. Is formaldehyde? Thank you. C-H2O is formaldehyde. Thank you very much. I stand corrected. I have the HCN right. I just didn't have the name right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Kelly. All right. It's been a great round of applause for Kelly. Woo I, I really always appreciate uh, uh, getting together with you, and I, I hope we get another chance soon. I, I should mention that uh, in a week I leave for Antarctica to hopefully see the total eclipse of the sun on wow. December 4th. <laughs> And uh, I don't think the, the odds are with me. There's about a 10% chance that we'll have clear skies that day. But uh, we'll get to, my wife will be able to claim her seventh continent. And that's, that's you know, happy <laughs> wife, happy life, right? <laughs> Kelly, will you be needing another GAC sweatshirt for the trip? <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, I, I, but I, you know, I think if you, if you, instead of the sweatshirts, if you started a line of, Thermal underwear, you might get some. <laughs> but where would I write GAC on thermal underwear? On, on the seat. <laughs> where, you know where the two buttons are that you drop down the... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that could change it to guac. <laughs> yeah. We could put it on the inside of the flap. Exactly, exactly. That's Southern, what... Southern exposure. Uh, <laughs> All right, anyway, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really it. Thank you. Hey, listen, for our uh, holiday party, uh, Kelly, I hope you can make it. We've got Rachel Tillman, who is uh, taking over uh, for uh, Pat, uh, whatever her name is, that was uh, one of the scientists on, uh, on the Viking. Oh, uh, yes. And she died uh, two months before she could speak to us.
Oh, wow. That's uh, awesome. Year, last year or the year before. So Rachel Tillman is going to be our speaker, and she's taken over all of the, uh, the science uh, uh, preservation and library and all that. Uh, so that should be a pretty good one. If uh, I'll, I'll send you an invite. Uh, that'd be terrific. Thank you. Thank you very all much. All right. All right. Close it up shop, folks. Thanks for coming. All right. Thank you, Thank Michael. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.